Hey guys, as the gospel moves to new people and new places and new churches are formed, the function of church begins to come to question. In this video, we're going to answer that question with a simple tool called the Handy Guide to Church. Answer five questions. Who, what, where, when, why about church. Be really helpful and it will answer some of that question of the function of church. So that is coming up. Hey guys, my name's Mark. Please subscribe to our channel so you get this content right there in your inbox and you don't miss a video. All right, guys, I want to give you a power-packed introduction to the function of church. As new churches form or churches begin to go back to that question of why do they exist, it's helpful to revisit a simple structure for understanding church. Lots we could say from the New Testament, but we're going to use this tool today called the Handy Guide developed by practitioners in the No Place Left Network that will help you understand what is church and how does it function. So this answers five questions in this Handy Guide, which you may remember from all the way back in like eighth grade grammar, English, who, what, where, when, why. We're going to look at a passage found in Acts chapter 2, verses 36 to 47, in which Peter stands up, the Holy Spirit has been poured out, and there's mass confusion, and people are beginning to make assumptions about the believers who are gathered, that they must be drunk, and Peter brings order to it, and the church is formed. So power packed into these few verses, answer those five questions about the function of church. Peter stands up and he says this, this Jesus whom you Israel have crucified, God has made the Lord, he's made him the Christ. Well, the people are cut to the heart by his words and they turn to Peter and the other apostles and they say, what should we do, brothers? And Peter says, repent and turn from your, your wicked ways and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. And those who are near, those who are far off, will be brought back into this story. And so with many other words, he begins to exhort those who are gathered that day to save themselves from this generation. And 3,000 respond that day. And they begin to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, to the prayers. And awe and wonder begins to come upon them because signs and wonders are performed by the apostles. They begin to give to each as they have need. And they continue to go to the temple daily for worship. And then the, God begins to add to their number daily those who are being saved. So packed into here is the formation of the church and it answers these questions. First of all, who is the church? Well, simply, we learn from this passage that the church are those who turn from the ways of the world, believe in this Christ, and become baptized as an entry point into demonstrating they are called out from the world and a part of this new way of life in the practicing learning community that is the church. 3,000 are added to this number in this day, and a new church is formed. So who? It's those who come out from the world and are brought into this new way of life. So what is the church? Well, we find out from this passage that the church is primarily not about a, a set of beliefs, but is instead about a people who are putting into practice a lifestyle. We see here immediately after these 3,000 are brought in, What's noted is the fact that they begin to practice a life together. They're devoting themselves to a kind of teaching. They are beginning to break bread together, to meet together, to pray together. They're doing some certain activities that begin to form a framework for them to live out a lifestyle together. There's about 12 practices that I identify and others see in this passage. You can find this in a tool called the Church Circle, which I'm not going to go through today, but you can check out the linked video here to learn more about that. But the church is those that begin to practice a lifestyle together. That's what a church is at its core. Where did this church meet? Well, in Acts 2, verse 46, we find them meeting house to house. We also find them going to the temple daily. We fast forward to Acts 5, 42. Here again, we have Luke chronicling the fact that they met house to house, but they also went to gathering in the temple. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3, here's Saul ravaging the church in his religious zeal, and he's going, it's recorded, house to house. As we follow the formation of this church and its growth throughout the book of Acts, we find them meeting again and again house to house. We do find at one point Paul meeting with disciples in what's called the Hall of Tyrannus. This is in Acts chapter 19. So we find these disciples gathering house to house, but also strategically using large gathering spaces to begin to reason, to celebrate what God is doing, and to build momentum for the movement that is primarily taking place in a house-to-house -house 
way. Okay, so when? When did the church meet? Well, we find here in this Acts chapter 2 passage that they met daily, house to house in their homes. They are gathering together. This, again, implies the fact that they had a lifestyle of gathering together. Especially as Americans, we can get into an event-oriented worldview or mindset that focuses in on a way of doing church that is one event to the next to the next. And part of our challenge or growth point is to begin to open up our lives. And part of this happens through proximity. We, as we get into geographic space of being close to our disciples day in and day out, church begins to become a lifestyle and not simply an event. But it is an event at, at some point too because there's these gatherings that happen daily in the Hall of Tyrannus we see with Paul. We also see them meeting in Solomon's portico. So there is some place of event, but we have Americans have overemphasized this this particular part of what it means to be church. So there is some element of meeting in an event-oriented way. We find this in the book of Acts, but we have overemphasized this in our Western event-oriented worldview. Instead, we look back at the early church and we see that they primarily met as a lifestyle in everyday life, house to house. So finally, why church? And this is a little bit more implied from the passage of Acts chapter 2, but I think it's actually very much there and very important that we draw why church from this passage. The Holy Spirit has been poured out, and this entire story of this church being formed here is in reaction to, in response to the Holy Spirit coming. In fact, as the church begins to practice these things together that we find here in Acts chapter 2, it is in empowerment of the Holy Spirit, it is in response to the Holy Spirit, and we find here the writer of the book of Acts, Luke, giving this allusion to this idea of a new temple being formed in God's people. So we find throughout the Bible that God is meeting with his people through a temple, and this is the place where they come to experience God's presence. But now God is forming a new temple, and his temple is within the heart of believers, but also, and specifically in this passage, is in the relational dynamics and the practice of believers with one another. So it becomes important for us to think about why church in in terms of its functional role as hosting the presence of God. God wants to cover the earth with his glory as the waters cover the seas. And the ultimate goal is that this would happen in the context of the relational dynamics of his church. As we begin to work out those relational dynamics, the kingdom comes into the earth. So, God's church is the vehicle through which his kingdom is going to come and ultimately be the host of his presence. So I hope this is a helpful tool as an entry point into understanding the function of church. Check out a link in this description to another video unpacking this handy guide that will also help you to understand this. So I hope this is helpful for you guys and bless you. Much love.